Hello everyone, my name is Daniel and I'm a programmer and an artist. This video is going to be the fifth in a series on modeling a low poly 3D game asset from scratch. In the previous episode we made the actual low poly model, the geometry that will be the final version of it. Um, and in this video we're going to now increase the resolution of the high poly. So I guess one way to think of it is that we first sort of modeled a base mesh, then we deleted a little bit of that to make the low poly, and now we're going to add a bunch of extra points to it to make it a high poly. It's not going to be extremely high poly, I'm not going to do any sculpting or anything, but it will be higher poly than the low poly. Now the main way that we're going to increase the resolution of these um, sort of low poly base meshes we have is by using bevel modifiers. We might use a couple of subdivision surface modifiers, but um, it's mostly going to be bevels. I also gave a little bit of thought about how much detail I wanted to go into as far as adding details to the high poly mesh that are kind of like fake details or surface level details, such as like text or labels or little buttons and knobs, like things that aren't going to be in the low poly at all, and they're not even really in the high poly, they're just sort of like floating in uh, there for the bake to, to render. Um, so I want to show how you can do that, but I'm probably not going to like add a bunch of those to the model. I'll probably like show it and then delete it. But before I finalize this asset, I would probably make quite a few tweaks to different shaders, make different metal parts slightly different colors, and or use different sorts of metal. I might paint the wood in certain places and things like that, but um, I, I think that's beyond the scope of what I want to cover in this. I do want to show several things that I like to add to most shaders before I bake the high poly, um, and that's like edge damage and um, randomizing the color of each mesh island, things like that. There's some cool tricks you can do with that with, uh, by using some geometry node stuff. And the way that I find the sharp corners actually um, dictates what the high poly, uh, t what the topology of the high poly mesh looks like. So I need to show that as well. Anyway, that's enough rambling. That's what the plan is, though. I'm not sure how much of that I'll get to in this part or if we'll need to do another one. But um, let's get started and we'll see. So the first thing I'll show is um, the three modifiers that we're going to want to add to basically all of these uh, pieces that we have here. And so we'll work on this piece here first because it's very simple. But those three modifiers are going to be the random island values. And that just creates an attribute called random. And it gives each separate piece of geometry in the, in the mesh a different random value. Then the next thing I want to add is an, is an edge attribute. This one here. And this is a simple... So the, the random island values is in my geometry node assets. But all it does is it captures a random attribute with the, the random value that's a vector, and the ID for that is the island index, so each island gets a different random value. And then you can just name it. But it's literally a capture attribute node, or store named attribute node. Then the edges attribute is also just a store named attributes node. It's, I named it edge, and it captures the signed angle of the edge on, you have to evaluate that on the edge domain, and then it's captured on the points. So it's essentially, the pointiness value in a shader. So if you go to a shader and you add the geometry input, you have this pointiness thing here, which you can't actually use in uh, Eevee, which is annoying. But um, in e with, it actually works in bakes because you have to bake with cycles, but the fact that you can't preview it in Eevee is um, kind of annoying. And I think even if you're in, if you're using cycles, and you go to material view, it doesn't show up in material view, it only shows up when you render. Anyway, so because of that, I don't typically use pointiness. But it serves the same function if you capture an attribute in geometry nodes named edge, that's the, I mean, you could capture the unsigned angle or the signed angle, depending on what you're trying to do. Anyway, then in your shader, you can read those attributes. So we're, we need to edit our shaders. Currently, we just have two, so it'll be pretty easy. But we want to um, first we want to input an attribute, and that one will be random. And we can separate the x, y, z of the vector. And now we have this random value that we can use in some way. And so the way I want to do that is with a soft light, just because it kind of gives interesting results. And we'll just plug that into B and we'll choose a pretty low factor. So we've done that for the wood shader. Now let's go ahead and just group this to make it easy and we'll call this random value. And then let's go to the metal shader and let's add that 
random val group and pop it in there on the metal shader as well, just so that both of those um, are making use of that random attribute. So all of the so if you have any so anytime you have a mesh that has a multiple pieces in it, um, each piece will get a slightly different color. Then the other one I want to add, I have a pre-made group for it because I use it a lot, um, but it's called Edgeware. And essentially what it is, is it's just a texture. I pick some kind of a noise texture. And then that is mapped with box projection, which is triplanar mapping um, in object space so that it's the same scale and everything. And I will often make little tweaks to this node in each file. So it's not all set in stone for sure. And then there's just some controls to add to that value to grow it. Um, this is the negative side of the angle and the positive side mixed together to adjust the color of the texture of the base color by that edge angle multiplied times a strength value and then you can choose a color to edit that so you can see right here it blew everything out but if we come in here and we inset all of these faces then the effect will only be interpolated between this edge here that has the sharp angle and the next edge down and so the middle stays separate which is why you have to modify the topology of all of your high poly pieces, which can be kind of a pain if you have a lot of them. So if you have a ton of pieces, um, it might actually be worth it to find your edges a different way. There are other ways you can do it. One way is you can actually bake out the normal map as a texture, like a 16 bit texture, and then you can blur that and load it in and compare the difference between the blurred normal map or baked normals of the object and the actual normals of the object and where they're the most different is going to be your edges, but that requires baking a texture and then loading it into a shader. So it's, um, there's like a, there's like a pre-pass step that has to be done every time you change the normals. But if you have literally hundreds of objects, you'd have to edit the topology of to get to find the edges, then it might be faster to do it that way. Anyway, on this edgeware node, we can grow, um, how strong the effect is and we can change the strength of it. So I think something like that would be good. And then let's pick a color that's similar to this wood texture and I'll just brighten it up a bit, something like that. And again, the quality of this is gonna vary depending on how close you're going to be to the final object. So I know I'm going to be fairly far away from this. It's gonna be smaller on the screen so I'm trying, so it's, the effect is going to be heavier if you get close to it, than it probably should be if you're going to be viewing this really up close, because here it kind of breaks down and you're like, the, the edge where doesn't look so realistic. Um, and you might want to affect the normal map and stuff as well. But from this distance, it looks pretty good. And that's the, all the closer you're going to be seeing it from. So let's add the same to the metal texture. Uh, we want edge wear. And, and then let's select both of these and we'll go to the modifier. All right, let's actually, we'll add one more here. We'll add a bevel. Set it to 0 0.01. We'll give it four segments. Set the angle to 60. Cause that should be a pretty good base for everything. The bevel, we're actually gonna edit quite a bit on different um, parts of the mesh, but let's select all of our parts here. And then we want to just copy all of these. So let's copy to selected, copy to selected, copy to selected. It's important that the bevel comes after the edge angle, because if you put the bevel before the edge angle, it sort of dilutes the effect. All right, now everything generally looks pretty terrible. So, but this piece right here is done. So we, let's hide it to keep track. And then um, we just have to go around and edit all of these pieces. So on a lot of these, I think we can just do an inset and see what that looks like. I don't know why that was so slow. And if that looks good enough um, from a distance, then we'll stick to it. So this is a rounded piece. We want to change the bevel type to percent. In fact, this one, you could get rid of the bevel entirely because it's an, everything's smoothed over and you could just put a subsurf on it. That would be fine on this piece. Um, and also while we're doing this, Let's just put on this one, we don't really want the edges so much. So let's put it after the subsurf. This piece here, let's just add a couple loops. Um, 
And then here we'll select this top face and we'll do an inset. I don't know why this is going, oops. Let's not inset individual on this one, we'll just inset the whole thing. Flex pretty good there. This piece, um, this one, let's switch the bevel to percent, 25%, only one segment, no limit. And then we'll just put this up here before the edge attribute. And then maybe let's copy one after. Well, actually, let's put it ahead. On these detail pieces, since they're gonna be instanced multiple times, we don't really want any distinguishing features. They should look really generic because there's gonna be like, I don't remember, there's gonna be like eight or nine of these on the model and they're all gonna look identical because they're all use, gonna use the same textures. So we don't want anything that makes it obvious that this is the piece, the same piece over and over again. So that should be fine for that. We smoothed out the normals on all of those. Um, these are all done. Then let's finish off this piece. So here we still have some solidifies and things. Also at this point, you notice I've saved this as a new file. Well, actually, since I'm making the videos, I've been saving one for each video just in case I have to redo it. But at this point, if I knew I was going to be applying a bunch of modifiers potentially, I would usually save a new file just so I could go back to the previous version if for some reason I needed to. Anyway, on this one, let's go ahead and apply the solidify. And then we should be able to just select these outer face loops and do an individual inset on those to get us this. So I feel like this is too strong, so I'm gonna lower the color a little bit. Maybe make it a little bit yellow. Something like that, and we can hide that piece because it's done. And then on this one, we're gonna wanna change the bevel type to percent, 25%. We'll make it one segment. And then the way we can control what that looks like is by adding a loop and pulling it out to the corner so that it ends up being 25% from that loop. And we'll do the same back here. And then here we can do an inset like this, but then we can set the limit method to none. So that'll round out this way. And then we can make a copy of it to increase the resolution. That one's done, we can hide it. Then on this one, we don't actually need this face. Let's get rid of that. And then we can simply switch the bevel type to width and we can give it, or not width, 2%. And we can give it uh, 25%, one, and no limit. And then we'll make a duplicate of that. And let's actually pull one of the bevels above the edge attribute. We don't really need, I don't mind a little bit of the sort of grunge texture showing up on that because it um, adds texture, but that's round so it doesn't really need corners. All right, now we have this piece here. Um, I guess let's just go around. We'll select this face and do an inset on it. And then we'll select from here to here and do an inset. So I'm just sort of looking for where there's an angle change. So right here, the angle changes a little bit so we'll leave a corner there. So then from here to here, we'll select and we will inset that, not individual. And then from here to here. I don't know why this is going so slow. Something is slowing it down though. Oh, uh, let's do these two together. Maybe to here. You're never gonna see that anyway these, these, like that. All right, this piece here is done, so we can hide it. Next, let's do this piece. It should be very simple. We should just be able to, I think we can just select everything and do an individual inset. And then it looks like the normals on this messed up, so let's fix this. All right, I think that is good for that piece. So we'll hide that. We can hide these. All right, this piece here, we want to apply the shrink wrap and the solidify. And then we can just add some loop cuts and then do an inset on this. Oops. 
I think that should be fine. Then here, um, I think we can just select this, do an inset. Maybe just put a loop there, should be fine. We can hide that. On this piece, we can, um, I think we can just do a subsurf and put that before the edge angle. That should be fine. It's gonna be small enough. Same on this one, subsurf, get rid of the bevel, put the subsurf before the edge angle. Hide that. On this one, we can select this face here and do an inset. And then let's add a loop. And then this one, we could actually switch to percent, none and one at 25 and see what that looks like. I think I like that, so let's um, duplicate that modifier. You can hide that. Let's do the same for this one here. So we will select this, do an inset, add a loop. Let's do percent, one, 25%, no limit. And then we will make a copy of it. Can hide that. For this piece, um, I think we're gonna, the best way is probably gonna be to split this round part out. And on this one, we're gonna do the same. We're gonna switch it to percent, 25%. And then let's make a copy of that and we will put it below the edge attribute. And then we simply need to add a couple of loops to sharpen this up. Another, some on the inside even though that's probably not visible. Then on this one, since it's square, select this part, oops, and this part, and we will do an inset. And then let's just add a couple of loops like this. Actually, that doesn't work. Um, so we'll select these here and do an individual inset. All right, on these, we're gonna wanna again do percent, 25%, one segment, make a copy of it. Uh, and none on the limit on both of those. And then over here, we're gonna wanna add loop cut, loop cut. We're gonna wanna select these two vertices, grow the selection and do an inset, not individual to get that corner. Now we have this piece here, which I should have done first. So let's unhide all of this and deselect that and then hide it again. So on this one, let's undo our bevel and the edges attribute in the random. Then let's go over here, let's apply this geometry nodes group, which remember has the Boolean in it and whatnot. Um, and then we can come back over here and turn all of these back on and hide that. So that way we, we just don't do the boolean through the bevels that we added. Um, so here should just be able to apply the solidify. And then what if we just add a couple of loop cuts here? And this one. That's fine, but this one looks good. Uh, this is a little bit too much. So let's select both of those and do an inset. Should be fine. This one, uh, let's just select the whole thing and do an inset. That did not work. We will select these two faces and do an inset. And then we'll select this face and do an inset. All right, that part's done. Then we have the wheel. This one here, since it's round, we probably wanna to try to do percent. One at 25%. All right, once we have that bevel, I think the way we actually wanna do this is by adding loops. So let's just add loops to everything. And then we can make a copy of that bevel modifier. On the spokes, uh, it should be really easy. We can just set the bevel mode to percent. 
make a copy of it, add it after that should be good for that. For this piece, for this piece, um, I think we'll do the same, no limit. Oh, this still has the, let's apply the screw modifier just so we can do loop cuts because it's way faster. Can't see, do one here, do one here. I think that should be good, let's add a copy of it. Apply that, uh, same for this one, again, because it's round, so no limit. And then we're gonna wanna add some loop cuts here like this. And then we can make a copy of the bevel. And this piece, um, same again, percent, 25%, one segment, none on the mode. Something like this. Can hide that. Then we have these spheres. These can probably get a subsurf. And we can keep the edges attribute first because they'd be like hitting the ground and stuff anyway. So that makes sense. I think again, we got round parts, so we'll, we will do 25%. And then let's just add some loops in here like this. Same here. Loop. And then on these, let's select the end faces. We'll do an inset and we could add a loop here maybe. Those are done. All right, all that's left is the barrel. This actually has a different material for some reason. I'm not sure how that happened. So we'll switch these materials. And then again on these, we're gonna want percent 25 and one. We're gonna want to inset this at a loop and then we need none on this copy can maybe add a loop subdivide that all right that's essentially what i would do as a first pass of increasing the resolution um, i would probably at this point do a quick bake just to test and see what it looked like and then i would start adding um extra details i wanted Anyway, that's one way of adding an edge damage effect to things. It's kind of annoying that you have to go in and add all these extra edge loops and do insets and stuff. That reminds me of like the style of modeling you can do for subdivision surface, which I kind of hate because it makes the mesh really hard to edit once you have all those loops. But if you do it as sort of an effect afterwards, and like I said, if you make save a copy of your file before you do it, um, then I guess I can live with having to do that. Um, if anyone knows of a different way that you can get sort of pixel-based edge detection uh, that you can preview in the material view like this, um, where it, this is where the material preview shows you what the final result will look like. Um, yeah, I've been trying to figure out another way to do that for a long time, but this is the fastest I know of to use the attribute and then you have to modify the geometry so that it doesn't interpolate across an entire flat surface. But since I almost always add bevels to everything anyway to make the normals flatter on the flat surfaces uh, so you can use smooth interpolated normals, then um, that's really not that much extra work. But yeah, that's generally a big part of my process for sort of up that base mesh to a high poly to bake. Anyway, in the next one, we'll talk about adding some details and maybe get to baking, we'll see. That's all I've got for this one. Thanks for watching.